This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 16, Don't Mess with Balram. Last episode, we left off with the victory of King Jarasan's 18th army against Krishna and Balram. Rather than standing against the army and eliminating it like they had the previous 17 armies, this time Krishna and Balram ran away, allowing Jarasan to believe they had been killed. Jarasan returned to his kingdom of Magadha in triumph. The number 18 will show up again during the Great War, which will last 18 days. Also, the Bhagavad Gita is in 18 chapters, and the Mahabharata itself is divided into 18 books. The rumor of Krishna's death could not have lasted long, because the next thing we hear is of Krishna and Balram entering the international marriage market. Being the eldest, Balram married first, to Rivati, the daughter of Raivata, king of the Anartas. Krishna's marriage was something of an elopement, Kshatriya style. This story begins with Bhishmaka, king of Vidarbha. This king had five sons and one daughter. The eldest son was named Rukmi, and his daughter was named Rukmini. We are told that Rukmini was the reincarnation of the goddess Sri, Vishnu's consort, and so she naturally desired to marry Krishna. Rukmini had heard tales of Krishna's exploits and was only interested in him. In Dwarka, Krishna had also heard of Rukmini, how she was intelligent, kind, generous, and loving, and he also thought she would make him a good wife. Rukmini's family mostly thought this would be a good match, except for her older brother Rukmi, who was a protege of Jarasand and who wanted her to marry Sishupal, king of Chedi. Rukmi persuaded his father, and the two of them arranged the date for her wedding to Sishupala. When Rukmini heard the news of her impending marriage, she enlisted a trusted advisor to go in secret to Krishna and beg for his help. Krishna respectfully greeted the emissary, who delivered a message from Rukmini. In it, the princess explained her situation and begged Krishna to come take her away. She even suggested the time and place. A few days before the marriage, the wedding party would make a procession to the foot of the temple of the goddess Parvati, just outside the city walls, and Rukmini would be at the front of the procession. Krishna only needed to show up with a fast chariot and pluck her out of the crowd and return home with her. Rukmini also swore that if Krishna did not save her, that she would starve herself to death and would continue doing that life after life until she could finally marry Krishna. Krishna readily agreed to the rescue attempt, and he immediately ordered his chariot to be prepared and set out for Vidarbha. Meanwhile, in Vidarbha, the wedding preparations had commenced. The whole city had been decorated and cleaned in preparation. Gifts were made to the holy men, Brahmins were hired to chant the Vedas, while the groom's wedding party, including Sishupal's father, King Damagosha of Chedi, King Jarasan, Salva, Dantavakra, and others, made an enormous procession to the bride city, Vidarbha. All these kings were sworn enemies of Krishna, and they came armed. Balram heard of Krishna's departure for Vidarbha, and, expecting trouble, he too set out, along with a large Yadava army, to help in case trouble broke out. When Krishna and Balram arrived at Vidarbha, they simply presented themselves as wedding guests, and King Bhishmaka took them at their word and provided a mansion outside the city, away from the Jarasand faction, where they could stay as his guests during the festivities. The very next day, the wedding party commenced the Parvati procession out of town. The procession reached the temple of the goddess, and Rukmini entered the temple and carried out the ritual devotions as directed by the elderly women of her clan, all the while secretly praying to the goddess that Krishna would come for her soon. Rukmini finished her devotions and walked out of the temple, scanning the horizon for any sign of her savior, and then she saw an approaching cloud of dust. Before anyone knew what was going on, Krishna rode up to the temple steps, loaded Rukmini on his chariot, and raced away from the crowd. At the outskirts of town, Krishna met up with Balram and his Yadava army, and they set off together for Dwarka. Jarasand and his allies quickly ran back to the city to gather their forces, and, once assembled, they raced furiously after their enemy. As they closed in on Krishna's forces, the Yadava army turned and stood its ground, awaiting the allied attack. The Yadava army had been preparing for battle for many days, while Jarasand and Rukmi's forces were mostly hungover and had been completely taken by surprise. Thus, the battle quickly turned in favor of the Yadavas, and the attackers were repulsed. Sishupal was utterly grief-stricken. He had been humiliated by a cowherder. Jarasan knew the feeling all too well and comforted him, saying, Do not grieve, for all things must pass. In this world, pain and pleasure are both inconstant for men, each coming and going in its season. We are just puppets dancing on a string in the hands of the Lord. I lost seventeen armies against Krishna, and only on the eighteenth time was I victorious. I waste no time weeping over fate. 
Joy and sorrow, success and failure are not in our hands, but are given to us by time when God wills it. Today a small force has raised our legions, but remember that when the wheel of time spins in our favor, we shall triumph as well. Thus comforted, Sishu Paul returned to his father's capital, Chedi, and all Jarasan's allies each returned to their homes, thinking of the time they might get their revenge on Krishna. Rukmini's brother, Rukmi, was not so philosophical, however. He could not bear the thought of having his will thwarted and his sister being married to a low-class man like Krishna. Rukmi recruited an Aksahini-sized army and rode after the Yadavas. As he departed, he swore an oath, saying he would not return until he had killed Krishna and returned with his sister. When he had caught up with Krishna's army, he led the charge immediately, firing three arrows at Krishna and calling on him to stop and fight. Krishna led Rukmi to the banks of the Narmada River, and then he turned his chariot around and fired a flurry of arrows, all of which hit their mark, shattering Rukmi's bow to pieces, killing his horses and charioteer, and cutting down his standard. Rukmi picked up another bow, and Krishna cut it down with more arrows. Having run out of bows, Rukmi charged Krishna with a variety of weapons, but Krishna shot them out of his hands. Krishna was pretty angry by this point and he drew his own blue sword and was about to cut off Rukmi's head when Rukmini threw herself at Krishna's feet and begged for clemency. So, instead of killing his defeated opponent, Krishna stripped the prince naked and tied him to a tree. Roaring and laughing, Krishna shaved half the hair on Rukmi's head and half his beard and mustache, while the prince of Fidarbha crapped his pants in fear. While Krishna was dueling with Rukmi, Balram had led his army against Rukmi's Aksahini and routed it sending the survivors back in flight to their home country. Following this victory, Balram found Krishna in the act of humiliating his future brother-in-law. Balram cut Rukmi's bonds, helped him to wash up in the river, and gave him a new set of clothes. He then scolded his younger brother, saying, This does not become you. To disfigure a relative like this is the same as killing him. Barely suppressing a smile, Balram continued, One must never disfigure a relative like this, no matter what he might do. He should only be turned out or sent away. You already shamed him by abducting Rukmini. That by itself was equal to death for Rukmi. You did not have to kill him again like this. Balram then turned to Rukmini to defend his brother. My dear, the truth is that men are subject to their own karma. Do not think badly of us for what your brother has suffered. Perhaps he brought this upon himself. This terrible dharma has been ordained for Kshatriyas by Brahma himself. In battle, a brother must kill even his brother. Only the Lord's Maya deludes one to believe that one's relatives should be above the law of karma. God is the same in every being, only ignorance and illusion perceive him as being different or many. Ignorance identifies the Atman with the body, then the soul feels the body's experiences to be his own. This binds him to the wheel of births and deaths, to transmigration. In truth, the Atman has no union or identity other than with itself. The body, the mind, and their experiences have no existence apart from the Atman. They are not real. The ignorant experience the world of samsara the same way a sleeping man experiences a dream. So, lovely princess, realize the truth that sorrow is also just an illusion, which deludes us and dims spiritual consciousness. Realize this and be at peace. Rukmi was released and stuck to his oath. He did not return home, but instead built a new palace for himself and called it Bhojataka and declared again that he would not return home until he had killed Krishna and rescued his sister. Meanwhile, Krishna returned home victorious with his fiancée at his side. The people of Dwarka greeted him rapturously and admired his new bride. Within a year of their marriage, Rukmini gave birth to a son whom they named Pradyumna. Pradyumna was actually the partial incarnation of Kamadev, the god of love. We are told that sometime before his birth, Kamadev had tried distracting Shiva while Shiva was practicing meditation. Shiva opened his third eye and fried Kamadev into ashes. To recover his body, Vishnu told Kama to incarnate as Krishna's firstborn son. As you might guess, being both Krishna's son and the incarnation of the love god made Pradyumna quite a lover when he got older. His childhood is kind of a strange story, however. Almost as soon as Pradyumna was born, he was kidnapped and thrown into the ocean. This story begins with an asura named Sambara, who heard it had been foretold that he would die at the hands of Krishna's firstborn son. So, when he got news that Rukmini had given birth, Sambara took the form of a nurse, abducted the infant, and tossed him into the ocean. As the child was drowning in the sea, a large fish swallowed him up. 
The fish was then caught in a fisherman's net, and the large fish was coincidentally delivered up to Sambara's palace kitchen. The cooks cut up the fish and discovered a beautiful golden child inside. The cooks called for the head butler, a woman named Mayavati, and showed her their discovery. She too was amazed to see this child, but an even stronger and mysterious feeling of infatuation also tugged at her heart. Just then, sage Narada showed up out of nowhere and told her who the child was. In addition, he told Mayavati that she was Kama's wife, Rati, and was born into this world to be reunited with her lost lover, who had been burned to ashes by Shiva. Mayavati then adopted this child and loved him to distraction, while Sambara never suspected that he was harboring the one destined to kill him in his own palace. Pradyumna grew quickly into a precociously handsome young man, and soon all the girls were lusting after him, including his own adopted mother. While still a teenager, Mayavati could not wait any longer, and she made advances on Pradyumna. Shocked, the boy said, Mother, how can you do this after you raised me all these years? Mayavati replied, You're not my son, Pradyumna. You're the son of Krishna, and you're an Amsa of Vishnu. You are Kamadev, whom the Lord Shiva made into ashes, and I am Rati, your wife. The boy suddenly remembered everything, and he knew she was speaking the truth. Mayavati told him, Sambara is your enemy, and the demon's death will be by your hands. The only way to kill him is with sorcery, and he is a master of illusion. Mayavati then taught Pradyumna the art and arcane secrets of Mahamaya, the way of the occult warrior. With this knowledge, he could dispel the most potent spells that Sambara could cast at him. When his training was complete, Pradyumna went to Sambara's court and hurled abuses at him. Hissing like a snake, eyes blazing, the Asura came out with the cudgel in his hand. With a roar, he whirled the weapon around and flung it like lightning at Pradyumna, who knocked it aside with his own mace and ran at Sambara. Sambara then began using his magic, disappearing and raining poison arrows on Krishna's son. Pradyumna responded by transforming the arrows into harmless flower petals. A big, dramatic magic fight broke out, but it ended predictably. Sambara leapt at Pradyumna, and the boy dispatched him the old-fashioned way, cutting off his head with the sword. The devas all gathered around in the sky and rained flowers on Pradyumna. Mayavati then joined the boy, and the two of them flew to Dwarka to meet his parents. The pair landed right in the middle of Krishna's harem, which was full of half-clad nymphs. They all crowded around this handsome Krishna lookalike as soon as he appeared. Rukmini then came across the boy, and had to be told that this was her long-lost son. Krishna, of course, knew exactly who the boy was, and had been fully aware of his career up to that point, but apparently he hadn't bothered to tell his bereaved wife that their son wasn't dead. Minutes later, Narada showed up and filled them in on the rest of the story. It is approximately this time in the story when the Pandavas appeared in Panchala and were married to Draupadi, so next episode we'll pick up where we left off with the main story. For the rest of this episode, however, we'll move ahead with a few more stories about Krishna that don't really intersect with the Mahabharata, but do shed some light on the characters of Krishna and Balram. As I've mentioned before, Krishna's relationship with Indra was strained at best. Krishna had to show him up by directing Gopa's sacrifice away from Indra, and a battle ensued with Krishna victorious. With the next story, we hear that Indra actually came to Dwarka as a supplicant, asking for Krishna's help in dealing with an asura named Naraka, who also happened to be the earth goddess's son. Naraka was powerful enough to bully Indra, stealing Indra's throne from Mount Meru, his royal parasol, and his mother Aditi's earrings. Krishna, in a more mythical mode, summoned the great bird Garuda and flew to Narakasura's capital, Pragyotishapur. The city had immense physical and magical fortifications, including some kind of anti-aircraft artillery. Krishna smashed the mountainous fortifications and deflected the elemental artillery with his Sudarshana Chakra. Krishna blew his conch, which rattled the foundations of the city, but it also awoke a kraken-like demon named Mura, who opened his five eyes and then leapt at Krishna, wielding a trident. Krishna used his arrows to slice up Mura's weapons and sealed up his five mouths, then he fired his disc-like chakra and beheaded the creature. Mura had seven sons, all horrible and demonic like himself, and, grief-stricken, they made a concerted attack on Krishna, who of course blew them all into dust with his power. Finally, Bhumidevi's son, Narakasura himself, came out to attack Krishna. Riding an immense elephant that could fly through the air, he led his demon army against Krishna. When he got in range, Naraka fired his satanyi weapon at Krishna, which was a spear with a hundred fireballs. 
At the same time, his Asura army fired thousands of missiles. In a moment, Krishna decapitated a thousand soldiers and killed their flying elephants. Garuda also attacked the elephants, slicing them to pieces with his massive talons. The remaining elephants could not face this terrible eagle, and they turned and fled back to the city. While his army fled, Naraka stood his ground. He threw his lance at Garuda. This was the same lance he'd used to drive off Indra and the Devas, but when it struck the eagle, it shattered into dust. Naraka then used his trident to attack Krishna, but instantly was beheaded by Krishna's shining chakra. The demon's head fell to earth, his mother, and the devas all cheered from the heavens. Mother Earth came to Krishna then, burying Indra's stolen items, and she prostrated to Krishna and praised him. She brought out Naraka's son, her grandson, named Pagadatta, and presented him to Krishna. Understandably nervous, the boy asked Krishna for his blessing. Krishna agreed to give the boy his blessing, and then he entered the city of Pragyotashapur. Entering Naraka's palace, Krishna found the harem containing 16,000 women, all former wives of the demon. All 16,000 women, as soon as they caught a glimpse of Krishna, fell instantly in love with him. They all desired to marry Krishna. So Krishna packed up all the booty from the palace and his 16,000 new wives and sent them all back to Dwarka. Krishna then flew off to Devaloka to return their stolen goods. He delivered up the throne, the parasol, and the earrings, and then came across the Parijata, the wish-giving tree. Krishna wanted to take it home as a gift for one of his wives, Satyabhama, but the gods refused to let him have it. So Krishna simply uprooted the tree and used it to beat off the devas who tried to fight, and flew back to Dwarka with it. Krishna explained what he did to Satyabhama, telling her, just days ago, Indra came begging to me, laying his crowned head at my feet, when he wanted me to kill Narakasura. Yet, once he got what he wanted, he showed his gratitude by attacking me. That is why Indra and his devas are not worthy of worship. They are blind with prosperity, foolish with wealth. As for the 16,000 beauties he had brought home, Krishna married them all in a single day. He gave each of them a palace, and he lived with every one of them, assuming a different body for each. He made love to them all, for they are all amsas of the goddess Lakshmi. All the women lived in a condition of permanent ecstasy. Each one had 100 handmaidens, but they always served Krishna personally, cooking for him, washing his feet, making betel leaf rolls for him, chatting with him, and of course making sweet love. As if having more than 16,000 wives were not impressive enough, each wife bore Krishna 10 sons, and each son was valiant, handsome, and intelligent as their father. As for Krishna's first wife, Rukmini, her brother had not forgotten his grudge. Things were made even worse when Krishna's firstborn by Rukmini, Pradyumna, actually abducted Rukmi's daughter from her swamvra and made her his own wife. I suppose enough years went by for his rage to die down somewhat, because Rukmi actually agreed to a third alliance with the Yadavas. This time, it was his granddaughter who was engaged to Krishna's grandson. They all got together in the city of Bhujataka to hold the wedding. Rukmi and his allies conspired to have a dice game with Balram, since they knew Balram to be a horrible gambler, but also addicted to it. Balram agreed to the game, and it started out pleasantly enough with small stakes. But as the game went on, the players became progressively more intoxicated from wine, and the stakes grew larger and larger. At first, Rukmi won each throw, until Balram was betting tens of thousands of gold pieces. Finally, when the stakes reached the millions, Balram won the throw but Rukmi knocked the dice off the table and declared that he had won. Surrounded by his confederates, they all supported Rukmi and lyingly declared that he had won. Balram glared menacingly back as the various kings taunted and laughed at him, but he downed a bottle of wine and then he raised the stakes yet again, this time to a hundred million gold pieces. Once again, Balram won the throw, but Rukmi blithely pushed the dice aside and declared victory. Balram growled at him, You lost, Rukmi. Rukmi turned to his friends and asked them to decide. They lied again, saying, Rukmi has won 100 million gold pieces. Suddenly, a disembodied voice spoke, saying, Balram played honestly and he won honestly. Rukmi is a liar and a cheat. Rukmi would not accept what the divine voice said. He mocked Balram, saying, You and your brother are cowherds that belong in the forest. What would you know about games of kings like dice? What would you know about any sport of the Kshatriya class? The other kings laughed viciously, and Balram finally lost his temper. In a flash, he seized his mace and smashed Rukmi's face with a blow that splattered hair, teeth, and eyeballs on the rest of the kings there. He then turned with a roar at the other kings. 
Balram was so drunk, however, that they managed to get away with only a few injuries. Rukmini and Krishna were nearby and heard the noise. When they arrived at the palace, Rukmini saw her mangled brother sprawl on the floor and she became hysterical. She turned on Balram and screamed, Is this why you saved my brother's life on the banks of the Narmada, so you could kill him yourself? She turned to Krishna for support, but he kept his mouth shut. He didn't defend Balram, but he also wouldn't criticize him. All Krishna would say was, It's time we went home to Dwarka. We'll finish up this episode with a couple more stories about Balram. The first is about Balram's return visit to Gokula, where he and Krishna grew up as cowherds in disguise. All the time Krishna had been away, the gopi women all thought only of him and longed for his return. Thus, when Balram returned to visit, all the gopis went to him asking for news of Krishna. Balram happily took Krishna's role in Vraja and became the gopis' lover, spending sixty consecutive nights with these women, drinking and making love. One night, the drunken lovers were having an orgy near the Yamuna River, but still some distance away. Balram was too drunk to get up and he mentioned to the gopis how he would like to bathe with them in the river, but it was too far away. He then called out to the Yamna to move itself closer so they might swim. The river, not realizing who was making this request, simply ignored him. Balram then grew angry, picked up his plowshare weapon, and stabbed the river, dragging it in agony towards the spot he had ordered it to move. The poor river goddess shrieked in pain and begged for mercy until Balram set it down in its new course. He then resumed his adulterous lovemaking with the gopis. The final story of Balram involves Krishna's son named Samba, who attempted to abduct a daughter of Duryodhana, the Pandava's evil cousin. While sharing in his father's audacity, Samba lacked his invincibility. Because Samba made off with the girl, but Duryodhana's good friend Karna rallied a force against him and they were able to pursue and then capture the boy. They tied him up with a rope and brought him back to Hastinapur as a prisoner. The meddling sage Narada made his way to Dwarka to report what had happened. The Yadavas were all incensed, and King Ugrasena ordered an army to be mustered. Balram, on the other hand, had always had a soft spot for Diodana and his brothers, and he objected to the idea of war breaking out. Balram had been Duryodhana's guru, teaching him mace warfare, and so he volunteered to go to Hastinapur and mediate the situation. Thus, Balram went to Hastinapur, accompanied by a token force and a herald. When he arrived at the city, he set up camp outside the town and sent a herald in. The Karvas were all delighted that their friend had come to settle the affair and came out to see him, bringing valuable gifts and a fine cow. Balram got right to the point and directed the Karvas to set his nephew free at once. A moment's silence followed. Then the Karvas' faces turned red. They said acidly to the Vrishni, This is wonderful. Time is mighty indeed when a lowly shoe seeks to ride upon a crowned head. We let these Yadavas marry into our clan, we treated them as equals by eating and drinking with them at the same table, by having them live under our roof in our palaces, we even gave them the throne and kingdom that they enjoy today, out of kindness and generosity. Have you forgotten who we are? Unless we decide to show you mercy, there's nothing you can do against our might. We are protected by Bhishma, Drona, and Arjuna, and even Indra would not dare provoke us. The Kurus then turned their backs on Balram and swaggered back to Hastinapur. Balram's eyes turned red with anger, saying, I curse myself that I came here in peace. Krishna was angry and wanted war, as did all the other irate Yadus. I disregarded them and came here like a fool, trusting the Kurus. I will wipe this race of Kurus from the face of the earth. He picked up his flaming plowshare weapon and strode over to the city walls of Hastinapur. He hooked his weapon under the edge of a wall and dragged the city into the river Ganga. Hastinapur rocked on the currents of the river like a leaky boat. Not long after, the Kuru chieftains all came running, humbly submitting themselves to Balram and asking him to save their city. After all the citizens and nobility prostrated themselves at Balram's feet, he forgave them and set the city back on solid ground. Then Duryodhana fetched a fabulous dowry for his daughter and returned both her and Samba to Balram's custody. This story ends with an interesting note. Until today, the city of the elephants, capital of the Kurus, stands awkwardly on the banks of the Ganga, where Balram once dragged her. She stands as if she might fall into the sacred river again. This point is particularly interesting because way back, near the beginning of the Bhagavata Purana, there's a genealogy that moves into the future tense. The narrator is speaking to King Parikshit, but he wants to convey the names of the generations that followed Parikshit, so he moves into the future tense saying that the king will have a grandson named Santanika, 
and his son will be Sahasranika, and so on into the future. This genealogy goes forward to name all the descendants of King Parikshit until the extinction of his dynasty many generations later. What is interesting about this is that when we get to the sixth generation after Parikshit, King Nemichakra, we are told that the Ganges flooded the city of Hastinapur and that Nemichakra abandoned the city and moved his capital to Kausambi. So, what we see here is that Balram's attack on Hastinapur foreshadowed the eventual flooding of that city. If any of you listeners are aware of the current state of Indian archaeology, maybe someone could tell me if the ancient city of Hastinapur has been discovered. It seems that if we could take this genealogy seriously, that we could find the date at which the city was flooded and abandoned, and then have a very close dating for the Kuru dynasty, perhaps within a century of the events in our story. Please email me at mahabharatapodcast at comcast.net or visit my website mahabharatapodcast.com and leave me a message. If I find out any news on this front, I'll be sure to pass it on. Well, that's it for the Krishna episodes. Next time, we'll resume the story of the Pandavas and find out how King Dhritarashtra deals with the fact that his nephews not only survived the Great House Fire, but also acquired powerful allies in Panchala and Dwarka. Thanks for listening.